wife to talk some more? Haven't I talked enough already? Yes, you have. That's what I thought, yeah. You still haven't gotten to the point. <laughs> <laughs> How could one have that many words? Let's go back and rehash last week. It's the, um, <laughs> it's the journey. It it's all about the journey. See, you guys are sort of my sounding board. So this is a new program I'm working on that I haven't shown to anybody yet. Have we seen this? No. no. Okay. So this is com this is rough, and there's a lot of gaps and missing stuff, but I thought I'd run through it anyway Good. so I get a chance to see it. What is scale and variance? <laughs> Works yeah. the same way regardless of size. <laughs> yeah. The form is similar regardless of the scale. It's a mathematical principle, but it definitely pertains to geological subjects, and this is why in a lot of geological images you'll see a, a rock pick or somebody standing there, something to give you the scale because you might look at it and have no clue as to what the scale is. I'm actually building the show here. Did it work? It worked. Okay, good. All right, because this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get from showing the normal you know, here we you've seen this slide before, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm trying to get what, what the whole point of this is to try to convey to people <clears throat> that here we have what we would consider the typical or the usual or the normal, the kind of thing that we would normally see in our day-to-day -day experience. And uh, the interesting thing here, here where I'm, the, the study that I'm doing <clears throat> is to be able to interpret this so that you look at the wavelength of something like this, which is the distance from you know from here to here, and the amplitude. So here's the wavelength. See, there's five, and there's eight. So you can see the wavelength here is about three inches, and uh, the amplitude of these is about three quarter of an inch to an inch. And the water depth that created these was just under two feet. So that gives us at least one example from which we could perhaps de derive some kind of a ratio between. Uh, the depth of the water, how fast the water was moving, and the size of the ripples <clears throat> that it leaves behind. So this was happening under, at, at the bottom of the water? Yes. This is deep. what would be called by a hydrologist the bed load. And as water is moving along, there will be larger stuff moving at the bottom, and that's called the bed load. And when the water slows down, which it'll do, Two things cause it to slow down. One is if it's going on a steeper gradient and then it goes to a shallower gradient, the water slows down. If it's going through a constricted area and that area opens out, the water slows down. The energy of the water to carry material is a function of how fast it's moving. So when the water slows down, it loses energy that allows it to transport sediment or debris or any such thing as that. So when the water slows down, it starts laying this material down. And it'll, of course, first lay down the bigger, heavier stuff and then successively lay down finer stuff. So what we see here is actually, this is, this is going to be on the bottom. As the water flows, you've got waves on top, and they're reflected by the sediment waves that you see here on the bottom. And as the water flows, all of these waves are migrating down current. They're all moving. What is happening is, the water flow is this way. The, the material is swept up, up, up the hill, and then it cascades down the other side. So what is happening is the ripple is constantly being eroded on the upstream side and being built onto on the downstream side. The net result is that the ripples migrate in the direction of the current flow. When the current flow stops, the ripples stop migrating. And then as the water drains away, it leaves the ripples. Can you um, tell the as, direction of flow by looking at the ripples? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, what you're going to see, what actually, to, in order to tell this, you have to look at it from the cross section, but the upcurrent flow, Linda, has a shallower gradient than the downflow. If you look at these ripples in cross section, they're not symmetrical. Mm -hmm. the, ups, the, the, the side pointing upstream is shallower, and the side pointing downstream is steeper. So that right there will tell you. There's a lot of what is called a paleocurrent indicator. 
that you can learn to read actually when you're out there looking. Now, then we get to this and we see here scale and variance. And by scale here, you see a highway right here. Here comes a highway. And what you're seeing there is current ripples whose amplitude up here in this area is 30 to 50 feet and whose wavelength is two to three hundred feet. So could we extrapolate from that and, and come up with an indication or an idea of how deep the water was and how fast it was moving? Well the answer is yes and that's what I'm trying to trying to learn actually right now is learn how to manipulate those formulas so that when we go out and there's actually a field of fossil ripples such as this, we can go in and measure the amplitude, measure the amplitude, measure the wavelength, factor in the gradient because as the gradient steepens the water goes faster. As the water goes faster it becomes more energetic. Now there's something we can learn from looking at this and that is that we're looking north here and the, the, the waves to the north are the largest ones, the ripples, and as you come towards the view or towards the south, they are diminishing in size, which tells us what? Well, it tells us that the water came from the north. It also tells us it was losing energy as it's passing over this. What's happening here is it's passing over. It's moving down this big valley up here, unobstructed. Now it got to a range of low hills which obstructed the water. When the water hit those low hills, it started eating them away. And what you see here is like scoured bedrock that has been eaten away by the water pouring over these hills. The, if you look at actually a cross section of those current ripples, what you see is they're composed of extremely coarse gravel. And that's gravel that was up here, part of these hills, as the waves swept over it pulled this material off, eroded it off, and then spread it for five miles down valley in a series of ripples. What about that divot? Uh, you know, looks like a golf divot. That's a delta. Be. Where? Here? Yeah. So like yes, that's far. exact. Who said that? I did. Jerry said this is a delta, and he's exactly <laughs> right. That's what it is. It's a delta. You know what a delta is? A delta? Oh, that's, just a good so, that's an arrow line. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great symbol for change. Is it the yes. What is the a delta? Over it's a triangle. Lo yeah. The, 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 for the mouth of the Nile River forms a delta. The mouth of the Mississippi River forms a delta. Yeah, New Orleans. New Orleans is built on a delta. Right. Um, where all the silt is dropped. All rivers have a yeah. delta. Yeah. What? Fertile land. Don't all rivers have a delta? Uh, probably probably of, of some scale or another. But now when you look at the Nile Delta and you look at the Mississippi Delta, the Mississippi Delta is a relic feature, primarily left over from the Ice Age flows, which were phenomenally greater than the modern flows. And actually what the, the modern flows are still building out, still building out a Delta, but it's minuscule compared to, you gotta bear in mind to almost half of Louisiana is a giant Delta. So what happened, what that means is, is that the water came in here and it actually filled this basin and formed a temporary bay or giant lake, if you will. And as it was filling up, this actually formed underwater. And then the water slowly drained off. And all of this, what you're looking at is, a fo is fossil features here that are somewhere between 11 and 13,000 years old. And the modern erosion has not affected these features at all because they're on such a scale that no modern forces have been even close to adequate to erode those away. And they will stay there. Those features will stay there as a permanent feature of the landscape until the next catastrophe. Because <laughs> it was a catastrophe that put them there and it's only a catastrophe that can remove them. Yeah, the main reason is that you know, rainstorms can move silt or even sand, but a lot of that stuff's cobbles and it's not, rain's not going to move. That's anything. right. 
That's right. And now, is it going to grow? It's not going to grow much, is it? No, it can't. it's not good for crops, but if you look at it cro close, it's got like scrub brush all over it. Um, it has been eroded. I mean, you can see here, look. See, that this was, this was cut into it after the deposition of the delta. This is a tree. I mean, that's like a huge tree right there that gives you some sense of the scale. In fact, you can't even tell, but that's that tree. This is a farm right here. You can't even see the farmhouse in there. So clearly, if there was a farmhouse, uh, if there was an equivalent flow that came through there now, you wouldn't have any farmhouses after it was over. I know what part of that delta do you think came from the ridge, and what part came from gravel up road? Uh, it's probably a mixture of both. I'm, I'm going to guess it's a mixture of both. Because as the water hits that ridge, I mean, you can see, if you look at this, you see that the that the delta is very much related to this scoured section. Yeah. Please. So this formed a major flow through. There was actually three flow throughs. And you can actually look at the, the current ripples, and you'll see like there's a separate train of ripples because there was a flow through that came this way. And then there was one, the main one came through here, and there was actually a third one a third one that you can't see that's out, out of the picture. So you actually have three fields of current ripples that all merge together. You see this, we have one coming in here from the west, which is the left, you have one coming in here from the right, and they actually merge. And this is the zone of mergence right here, and you can kind of see the ripples are having kind of a difficult time getting organized and getting in echelon, <coughs> as they say. You see that right here? How they're disorganized compared to here? Well, that's because you've got two streams coming together there. You don't think that the first one happened first and then it broke through the ridge closer to you? And It's difficult to say the exact sequence, although at the end result of this thing, the water was many hundreds of feet deep. Hey, Randall, which one is Mar Marco Pass was the one on the left? Marco right? Pass is this right that's here. Why, that's why it's when we were out there, it was just so huge. I could, it's just hard to believe that there was the one bigger than Marco Pass because Marco Pass was such an incredibly large. Yeah, when we were out there, I think we only went through Marco yeah. Pass. A couple of years later, when we went back and you weren't with us, we actually went over and so, climbed yeah. a, a small mountain over here so we could look across. Mm -hmm. So how high did you go up? What, what's the elevation of the uh, difference in elevation that we're looking at? This from, from the airplane is probably about 1,500 feet up, 2,000 okay, feet. But how far is it from, say, the bottom of the delta to the top of the ridge? Charles, I think we can actually tell right here by this map. <clears throat> you know, you, you would find it fascinating to look at the ripples in the sand in the Chattahoochee below Buford Dam. I'm and sure I would. Power itself. So, cause so far I haven't found anybody that has an easy formula to calculate. Mm -hmm. I've been looking for it. Well, I, I would think the size of the material you're dealing with would have a lot of... It does. Well, if it, it's it got does. clay in it or if it's yes. got big gravel, it would make a big difference, I think. Right. Now this is actually the map of what we just saw. And you saw, you saw where that highway was coming through the pass? Right here. And I said that there were three breach points. Here's the main one. That's where we saw that scouring mm -hmm. with the big, look, see right there, there's the delta. See it on the map? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Right there. Okay, and then the third pass through was right over here. And then there was actually a fourth, a spillway, an overflow through this route, and that's the means by which we can tell how deep the water got. Now let's see if I can see the contours on here. Um, that was the Clark Fork River Valley, wasn't it? Clark Fork River is at the mouth of this pass the mouth, over yeah. here. Mm -hmm. well, what about the big break in the ridge to the right of where you were? Right well, that, I haven't explored over there, so I don't know what happened over there. That Which might have been, that might have been, I think that was probably a back backwater area off the main routes. But there are ripples. That, yeah, it looks like water came yeah, through. Ripples that are, those are contour associated. Yeah, but you're not going to, at this scale, yeah, you're seeing this right here. Is this what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah. and the water coming through that. These area. actually represent the shorelines when the water. Never mind. 
And there's the tree. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so before we go on, notice here that the most of the draining of this big bathtub was to the south. The lowest point was to the south. But there was this mountain pass here that water also poured through. And with great turbulence and where this lake is here, that's occupying a scour trough where the water just gouged a hole into bedrock. And right, now see, as who said that there was the tree? Bill. Yeah, that's the tree that we saw in the first picture. That that one right there. So now you can see relative to there, you see the farmhouse. Bigger than that house. Yeah, so that tree must be fifty or sixty feet tall. But now you can also see from this how big some of these ripples are. And here you see the house, and you can see the, the ripples are like hills. And those ripples are, again, they're, they're 30 to 50 feet in amplitude from the bottom of the trough to the top here, and they're two to 300 feet from crest to crest. Same tree right there. And here we're seeing part of that delta. And here you can really see, see the current ripples, you've got one flow coming this way, and then you've got another flow coming in from the left meeting it. Yeah, those ripples are more radial. Yeah. And here is a Google Earth digital map of it. And here there's three passes. The Duck, Duck Pond Pass it's called, Marco Pass, the one that has the highway coming through it. And whenever we go on a tour out there, as you come through, it's just magnificent to drive down here. Right up in here, there's hot springs. So what you do is you stop and you soak in the hot springs <laughs> for a while. Get, get really energized. And then you get up and you drive down here and you come through this pass. And just as you're coming through this pass, you look to the south, down into the basin. And it's just, there it is. The whole ripple train is just spread out for three to five miles going south. And it's just magnificent. Just exhilarate. So, and then there's a pullover right here where you can stop and get out and really, you know, get a sense of the, the, the magnificent scale of it. What we did is we found a little four wheel drive track and went over here and climbed up on this hill right here. What state, what state are you in? This is in uh, Montana, yeah. western Montana. Okay. This is the That's Little the Bitterroot Valley up here. Mm -hmm. Little Bitterroot. And right up there is the Flathead Lake, Flathead Lake. And here you see the three passes, the Duck Pond Pass, Mar Marco Pass, and Wills Creek. And see, here comes the highway through here. Now this is a photograph that I took. Now here we're looking north. Here's the delta. See the delta? And this is, this is that Wills Creek, no, this is Marco Pass. So you can see how this is really eroded. This is, this is where the water has just gushed through there and plucked everything out. And here comes the highway going through here. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, view <clears throat> southwest over Marco Pass. But this, you see, you look at this, this is a feature that probably most people would look and just never have a second thought of. But now that you guys are becoming trained catastrophists, you can look at that and you see that what you're seeing there is the after effects of mega scale water erosion. That's what this was here. This, uh, just a gushing plume of turbulent water going from the right through this way down to the left. So when you come through this highway, it's, the hot springs is over here, and then when you come down this highway, you come through here and you pull right around, you pull off right here, and you get this magnificent view down valley. Sweet. Now you can see really how, how magnificent this current ripple field is. There, there's your tree with the farm. Here's your delta. But we went up here and climbed up this mountain over here in order to get a view back across. This is a scour trough. And, and these kind of features are created when the water gets really turbulent and it starts doing a vorticular. It probably process. has gravel in it, sand and gravel Yes, in it. undoubtedly, undoubtedly.
Is there any vegetation other than that one tree? Well, when you get down, it, you can't tell from here, but when you're down on the ground, there's, there's scrub all over the place. You know, I mean, there's stuff growing, weeds and stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's no forest. No. There's some cattle out there, so there's a little bit of grass, but not much. Yeah. Would you call it semi-arid? Semi-arid, that's exactly what you would call it. That's right. It's about 15 to 18 inches of rainfall per year right there. And here you can get a sense of... Isn't that... Oops. Okay. By now, you should be recognizing all of this, right? There's our tree with our farm, and here you can really get the perspective of how big this delta is compared to the farm. So just how deep was the water through here? Well, it wasn't quite that deep, but we'll see here. I've got one that'll show you how deep it was. Here we are looking right down on top of the delta and look see there's the farm right there see, that's like a little landmark we should all go visit those people how, how deep did you say the uh, amplitude was on, on these on these current ripples yeah. it varies between on the low end of course it diminishes down to nothing at the south end of the valley but at the north end where they're big they're 30 to 50 feet in height <coughs> and when you look at a cross section of this is what they're composed of the cobbles. A lot of mixed <laughs> stuff of all different sizes. And then interspersed in here, you'll find big boulders, you know, three to five to six feet in diameter, which is a clear indication of the, the force of the water. Okay, here is the picture I took from that mountaintop looking across. We're looking to the west across the top of this. And here, the, see the delta from this angle? There it is right there. And now, Rainbow Lake Pass, the mountain pass, you can see it very clearly right there. Now, that pass, by going through that pass, one can see the high water marks on the side of that pass, which are an indication of how high the water rose in this thing. Um, and I have put a little graphic in here to help convey that. That line represents the high water mark at the peak of the flood through here. So. You're, you're assuming that the water wasn't as high after it got through the pass as it was at the pass. Yes. Throughout the whole basin, the water was as deep. Because what happened is, you see, this, this pass right here was the low point other than the south. But the water was coming in faster from the north than it could drain out the south end. So the water rose up until it finally... You got a picture before the flood, this little trough wasn't there. So the water rose up to this level, breached that, and then cut that trough through as it as it poured out here. As the water level dropped, once it got below that trough, then the water, then this then this pass here became dry. And then the water all drained to the south. Would the ripples have been formed then? The ripples would have been formed as the water drained off. Right, so... The, the ripples are there during the course of the flow through there. Right. But then as the water slows down, the ripples which have been migrating down current, they'll eventually stop, and then they just basically freeze in place because as the water's dropping down, it's losing force, it's losing energy, loses the ability to keep moving those big current ripples. Mm -hmm. And so what you actually discover when you look at a cross-section of these current ripples is you have two sediment regimes. The first is very coarse and gravelly like you saw. Yes. And the amplitude of those current ripples gets smaller as you move from right to left, which tells you that the water is losing energy as it's moving to the south. The second thing is, is when you look at the size of the rocks composing the ripples, they're getting smaller as you go south to the left. That also tells you because the bigger ones are being dropped first. Then the third thing is, is when you look at them, you then see that over the top of the gra coarse gravelly ripples themselves 
is a frosting of real fine material, silt. The silt is what's left over from when the final draining of the water drains off to the south. And what you can see is that the silt goes from zero thickness at the northern end to about six feet thick at the south end. <laughs> see, we didn't know that the first time we were out there. Yep. I found out that later because, see, right here, what we've been talking about is very significant scientifically, and here's why. The current interpretation of what we're looking at here is totally contrary to what I've just been describing. And that is that these ripples were formed by the draining of Lake Missoula, of which this area was an arm. This area was an arm. Now, what you've got to realize is that what we're describing here is totally inconsistent with the draining of this basin, but is consistent with the filling of it. Now see, once you get that, that's a major, major contradiction within the current theory. Now the, the, the prevailing theory um, basically has taken what is a global event and tried to constrain it down to a, an event that only has local significance. And that's why I'm out to try to demolish that because right here is the proof that there are global catastrophes on a scale totally outside anything humans have experienced in historical times. But what mainstream science has done has tried to reduce the significance of this to a mere local phenomenon. So anybody who studies this and becomes familiar with the, 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 the arguments that are in the mainstream books and everything will see that what I'm saying goes contrary to that. So there is the high water mark. So how high is that actually to the ripples, if we want to add it to our calculations? Ah, well, let's see. You know, I have all these numbers, and because I have the maps, and I have, I have actually taken this data and compiled it, but I don't remember. I'm going to guess it's probably close to 1,000 feet from the bottom up to, to the top where we're seeing here. The maximum, because, well, we can go by this. The depth of the water through Rainbow Lake Pass was over 300 feet. <laughs> over 300 feet from the top of this line to the bottom of the pass. So I'm guessing this could easily be a thousand feet. Well, those, those, those 30 and 40 foot high ripples look puny compared to that line. So yeah. It's a lot, it's a, yeah, it's much deeper than the... Well, most likely at the peak of the flood, mm -hmm. everything was in such chaos yeah. that there weren't, maybe weren't even real ripples because mm -hmm. everything was just being swept along almost like a fluid tornado, a liquid Tornado. Yep. And in fact, when you see those scour holes, that's what you're really seeing the result of liquid tornadoes. Remember, you know, what I've told people ever since we were on the trip is, it's, it, you know, you look at some of those deposits that the, the picture you had with Brad in there a few minutes ago was a good example of that. It looks just like you threw all kinds of stuff from silt to sand to it's gravel a, and cobbles and a mix. A blender. It's a big mess. It's yeah, a big mix. That's yeah, right. It's like they put in a blender and threw it all across the state. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the aftermath. When you're looking at those rocks and gravel and stuff, what you're seeing is the wreckage of the world that mm -hmm. existed before yeah. these events transpired. Well, you say the wreckage of the world, but there's an aspect. Part of the hemisphere, what? A quarter of a hemisphere? A whole half of the well, world? Well, the, 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 the stuff that's here would have been dried pretty locally. Well, I mean, you don't exactly. have stuff here that's from, you know, like you don't have anything here that would have been from our part of the world. No. However, what, I'm, what I mean to but imply was... the size was, of Canada. Pardon? The size of Canada. Well, ultimately, we are talking about the whole world. Got got completely, shall I say, geomorphically rearranged at the end of the last ice age. The whole planet did. And everywhere you look, if you learn how to read the geological record, the signs are there. Oh, it's right here. I mean, we could go out probably in Sam's yard and dig a hole, and I could show you some evidence of it. But here, the effects are so subdued that people don't see it. Out here, they're spectacular. So what I've always said is the best way to get in your consciousness to this recognition is when you look at these very salient features here created by catastrophic floods then from there we can begin to recognize the more subtle features that are essentially created by the same phenomena, the same forces but on a lesser scale. 
Randall, about how deep would that the ice be in Canada? The ice in Canada varied anywhere from a few thousand feet up to three miles, perhaps, in thickness. <laughs> and three miles would have been roughly where over the where Hudson Bay now is, up Ontario and Quebec. You can picture your map of Canada. Hudson Bay is there because that's the deepest part of the thick thickest part of the ice, where the where the land got pressed the lowest. It's still coming back after the removal of the ice load. But the calculations are that it was a minimum of two miles thick, perhaps as much as three miles thick. So that's that's a major, and of course, there's no ice there now. So all of that ice had to disappear and go away. Periodically there's ice every few months. Yes. Every, a few months every year. Well, yeah, but it never accumulates more than, I mean, it's not, the last I heard, any time, no time in my life has the ice been three miles thick over Canada. Can I make a, just a statement? The land was pressed down. The land was pressed down. And that, that's not even including the land that was on top of that being eroded. Uh, true. Yes, there would have been a lot of land removed. Now here we see a serene Rainbow Lake Pass. This is called Rainbow Lake. Locally it's referred to as Dog Lake. Isn't that nice? Nice place to probably pitch a tent and camp. And yet, 12,000 years ago, this was the scene of an unimaginable catastrophe. And it was through this pass, we can see right here, the water rose and truncated these hills. Right here. These hills are about 300, more than 300 feet above the floor of the pass, which is now occupied by this lake. Now, the lake is formed where two separate streams came together, one from this way and one from this way. So where you have two streams coming together, that's where you get super turbulence. And it's the same way with atmospheric turbulence, when two air masses come together and they do this and they create that shear. The shear force is what starts this going. In, in, in atmospheric uh, phenomena, same with water flow. You had a stream coming in this way, you had one coming this way, so right where they met, you had super turbulence, and that's what gouged this hole that is now occupied by the lake. And this erosion here gives you the high water mark, because above this, you see the, the, the ground is still intact. So the water did not get up this high. It rose to this level right here. And you can actually see eroded rock in here, and that's how you can tell and read how deep the water was through this pass. As I remember, that was there's no real soil in that area around Rainbow Lake. It's all it's just, it's rock. It's all been it's yeah, it's all gravel. It's just, the yeah, soil is gravel been, that was moved. Yeah. Jeez. This is the Nash this is a wonderful, beautiful place, the National Bison Range, but there you see shorelines. See the shorelines? Now most people drive by on the road down here, see driving by on the road. Will drive right by, and if they notice them, they won't even. It ex apparently excites very little interest. But there it is, remnants of the fact that this whole this whole valley was filled uh, with water close to a thousand feet deep, temporarily, temporarily. See, we are in what was what conventional geologists call Lake Missoula. We're this would be in the lake basin right here. Would that flood have lasted a year? It could have lasted a year. I think it lasted, I think it was a pulsing thing that lasted more than a year. Because what we're seeing here is the record of all of that ice over Canada melting away and, and traveling to the ocean. And here we see, okay, do you guys see the shorelines? Can you see them? They're faint, but they're there. See them on the hillsides? Those are shorelines. And here's your classical U-shaped profile showing that these were occupied by massive glaciers back during the Ice Age that are now gone. And I'm going to skip through this because this is, this is advanced scientific stuff that would be over your heads. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> ah, but the question is, can you explain the significance of it? Force it. Better. Having seen this before, you must know the significance of it, right? <clears throat> All right. Well, there was a big catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we need to know, isn't it? That's right. We could go before all the the institutions of higher learning, and that's all we need to do, stand up and say, there was a big catastrophe. Well, see, they'll agree with that. The problem is, is we, we, would, we would not agree as to the cause of the catastrophe. Now, you look at this picture, and if you're now when the next time you guys are driving through the Clark Fork River Valley, and we're all going out there this summer, right? Is that right, Sam? Okay. <laughs> Notice where the tree line stops. That, where the, you have the bare eroded rock and then you get to solid trees, that's the high water line. That was a pretty significant river that flowed through this valley. Is that generally agreed by both sides of the argument? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it was agreed. Way, way back, J.T. Party, U.S. Geological Survey, looked at the same stuff we're seeing here back in the 1920s and 1930s. And he calculated that the, using hydrological formulas, he calculated that the volume of water passing through this valley was nine and one-half cubic miles every hour. <laughs> nine and one-half cubic miles per hour passing through this valley. And there, Every and there, hour. And there were no politicians <laughs> around to tax it. Is, <laughs> no, there weren't. <laughs> they would have, they'd have had the government there to put a water meter on it. So now, look at that rock face. See, a rock doesn't just end up looking like that by some normal process. What we're seeing there is the aftermath of an extremely turbulent, forceful, violent flow of water that once passed over these rocks and scoured their face like this. And uh, can I bring my fishing pole? Yeah. Sure. We'll cook it. Okay, now I'm going to stop here for a second and show. What I'm doing is putting this together to try to quickly and simply convey to somebody who does, has never heard or knows anything even at all about catastrophism or diluvialism or any of that, which is the vast majority, about 99.999% of the human population has not a clue that we actually live on a planet that is periodically undergoes global catastrophes. And the second thing they don't realize is that what we now know about the timing and tempo of these global catastrophes and the intervals between successive catastrophes is this. As we look at the last quarter million years, and this is a fact that you should really, really ingrain into your consciousness, is this. In the last quarter million years, the longest interval between catastrophes is the one we're in now. 